Amen. I feel this is a, a strange service because everybody on the program can sing. And they've put me in the middle of singers. Hallelujah. And maybe God is trying to punish me because my brother Michael was a keyboardist. A keyboardist. And we used to sleep in the same room. I would sleep on top. You'll be at the bottom. Because I'm the youngest boy in the house. And at night, he would wake up and be playing the organ. And I will just be sleeping. <laughs> I didn't take any interest in music. And when I went to Legon, he was the mass choir director. And my best friend, Yellow, was also in the choir. So I followed them to the choir. But when they were singing the mass choir songs, Kojo Pong of Sunny FM was the director. Jessica was the lead singer. Michael was the keyboardist. And when they move left, I move right. <laughs> when they are singing auto, I'm singing treble. I stayed in the choir for one year. Nobody knew I was in the choir. <laughs> so for, for many, as, as the last boy of eight children, I've tried to belong to many places. Because you are never good enough because you are the youngest. So they're always sending you. Somebody's going to Harvard. Somebody's a keyboardist. And you are talkative, always playing football. You amount to anything. So I've tried to live other people's lives. <laughs> but I came to a point where God said, now you have to live your own life. And I know there are some people here, what God has called you to do is not popular, it's not common. Even in your family, a lot of people don't, you know, they are doctors and lawyers, but you, your thing, no, it's not part of that thing. But listen, as they ministered to the Lord, Acts 13 2, and waited, as they ministered to the Lord and waited, the Holy Spirit said, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul. So, God has a definite purpose for your life. And in an atmosphere of worship and waiting, He's going to separate some people. He's going to separate you. <laughs> As they minister, it's not, it's not when they perform, it's the minister to the Lord. So, it's not a performance. It's a ministration, not to men, but to the King of Kings. As they minister to the Lord, the Holy Spirit spoke. And I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking today separating many onto different kinds of tasks. The thing God has called some of us to do is very weird because we are at heart media people yet we keep getting invited to speak at all kinds of church programs. And so God is raising a new generation of leaders hiding them in places Satan can't find them to destroy them. And God is interesting. He's hiding me on the radio. <laughs> if God wanted to hide a person you will hide him under some... I mean, imagine if I were hiding something. Why would you hide me on the radio? <laughs> you want to hide me and you are putting me on air. I don't know how that makes sense. But I tell you, God is working something powerful in these days. And tonight's service is a prophecy of what God is doing. Everybody who has come has flowed in the spirit of the one who came before. It's not a competition. We are flowing in the same spirit. The days of one man thousands are over. The days of one man mountains are over. God is doing a new thing. When Elijah tried to bring down Ahab and Jezebel by his own strength, after slaying 420 prophets by the sword, he sat under a juniper tree and said, God, kill me because I'm tired. And the Lord said to him, although I've used you, you have a wrong concept of where I'm going. Because Elijah said, they've killed all your prophets and I'm the only one left. And the Lord said, I will never leave myself without a witness. Even under the evil demonic reign of Jezebel and Ahab, I have kept for myself 7,000 who have not bowed to Jezebel nor kissed their idol. And so when Elijah's ministry was coming to an end as one man thousand, God began to speak into his life and said, now I want you to anoint the next generation. The next generation shall not be like the first because the first generation is like Mount Kilimanjaro. It's one mountain. When you are climbing to Kilimanjaro, over 6,000 feet above sea level, it's the only mountain you see among plains. So Kilimanjaro cannot be hidden. But if you go to Everest, Everest is a shoulder of mountains. It's in a place called Tibet. When I was young, I read a book called Tintin in Tibet. Tibet is not like Kilimanjaro. Tibet is a range of mountains. Some of them have names you can't pronounce. 
but they all carry the next mountain on their shoulder and, and, and Everest is on the top of that apex. And what God is saying is that in this generation, the days of one man thousands are over. He's raising a new generation. And when they come to lead and set the stage, the other one will follow. It's not about putting yourself on a billboard and taking all the glory. Those days are fast gone. He's raising a new generation. He said to Elijah, Elijah, now go your way and look for Hazael and anoint him as king of Syria. Syria wasn't a godly nation, but God was interested in the person who ruled in Syria. He said, when you finish, look for Jehu, the son of Nimshi, and anoint him to be king of Israel. And then find Elisha, the son of a name I can't mention, very wild name, and anoint him to be prophet in thy place. And look at the key. God said, it shall come to pass that the person who escapes the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay. And the one who escapes the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. I came to announce to you that as we've seen it today, the one who escapes the anointing of Calvis, he shall Isaiah slay. And the one who escapes the anointing of Isaiah, he shall Jometheel slay. And the one who escapes the anointing of Jometheel shall Jobitam slay. God is raising a new generation of leaders. We are not interested in title or position. We are not interested in being the primus inter pares. He's looking for a network, a network of leaders who will work in tandem as a team. Now listen. Listen. 20 years ago, the largest companies in the world were all owned by individuals. General Electric, General Motors, Tata. All these companies were built on the basis of brawn and the industrial revolution. Anything God is doing in the spirit, he reveals it to men, but men are too blind, they can't see. If you take market capitalization of the top 10 companies in the world, all of them are built on the basis of one principle. Whether it's Facebook, whether it is Amazon, whether it is Netflix, whether it is Microsoft, the top 10 companies are all built on a principle of the network. The days of one-man businesses are over. The days of one business that stands and defeats others is over. All the businesses that are changing the world are built on the principle of the network. Google is network. Instagram is network. Facebook is network. Apple is network. Amazon is network. Alibaba is network. What is God saying? I'm raising a network, a generation of people. They are connected not by hierarchy. It's not about position or title or fame or fortune. It's about each one feeling their part until we all come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ unto the perfect man. Now, God has not never been against one man. All the eras in the Bible have been characterized by men. In the when, 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 when creation started, we were led by patriarchs. Abraham was a patriarch. Isaac was a patriarch. Jacob was a patriarch. Then after patriarchs, we had priests like Midian, like, like Jethro the priest and Melchizedek. Then from the patriarchs, who did we come? After patriarchs, he now brought in the judges and the generals. So look, God has always worked with individuals. So from the Abraham patriarch to Moses, who now brought the law, and then you had Elijah the prophet. So it is patriarchs and priests. Then you have generals and judges. Joshua was a general. Then there was the era of the judges. After the judges, you had the era of the prophets and the kings. But look at it. After all those different things came and went, he raised up one man who epitomized all. So now there's only one man. Nobody is a big man anymore. Jesus was more than a patriarch. He says, Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced. Abraham saw David. They said, before Abraham was, I am. So Jesus was more than a patriarch. What about priesthood? He says, this priest is not like the ironic priesthood. He is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, who is both a king and a priest, having no mother or father, having no beginning or ending. This is the Jesus we are worshiping. So in the last days, there's only one man. He's more than the ironic priesthood. Now, what about prophets? There were many prophets in the day. Moses said, and the Lord is going to raise a prophet like me unto you. He's a different prophet. And as I lifted up the serpent, a 
when you had salvation, when you look unto him, you will be lighting. Jesus was more than a prophet. So in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 17 to 19, Peter speaking about the Mount of Transfiguration. He said, we saw his exceeding glory and we have the word of prophecy confirmed. So Jesus is the consummation and the epitomization of prophecy. That's why John said in Revelation 19, 10, that the testimony of God is the spirit of prophecy. So Jesus came to consummate all prophecy. He was higher than all prophets. Then we had the era of kings. Major kings and minor kings. But look at it. Jesus is higher than all kings. He said, For unto us a child is born. Isaiah chapter 9. And unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. <laughs> his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now listen to the next verse. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Ladies and gentlemen, kings have come and gone. Kings have come and gone. Daniel chapter 2, the book of Nezah had a dream. A golden image with the head of gold representing the Babylonian kingdom epitomized by Nebuchadnezzar. He's dead and gone. Following that kingdom, there was the chest of silver. That was the Middle Persian kingdom characterized by Xerxes who could rip men into two with open, open hands. A dangerous guy. Xerxes has come and gone. After that, we had the, the loins of bronze representing the Greeks. Alexander the Great, by 31, he had captured the known world. From all the way to India. Every time God is doing. So God uses human beings to usher in errors. Nebuchadnezzar for the Babylonians. Xerxes for the, for the Medes and Persians. And then Alexander the Great. Who by age 30 was a world leader. He represented the Greeks. Followed by the feet of iron. Represented by Caesar. The Romans. But look at it. He said and then there was the feet of clay and metal. Then out of a mountain came a stone which no one cast. And that stone hit the image from the bottom and smashed it into dust. And he said, it shall come to pass that God is going to raise a king in that day whose kingdom shall append all kings. So Jesus is a king, but his government doesn't end. He doesn't need elections. He doesn't need to be voted into power. So many people have made Jesus a constitutional monarch like Elizabeth. She is reigning but not ruling. She can't change nothing. She just endorses the ideas of people. That is not the Jesus I know. He says, this matter is by the word of the watchers and by the decree of the holy ones to the, the end that the living may know that God rules in the affairs of men. My Jesus doesn't just reign on the throne. He is the ruler of the universe. He's coming with great authority and power. He's the king of kings and the lord of lords. He's the one we worship. He's the one for whom we bow down. And look at it. This, this whole thing we are doing is about that one man. So the generation Jesus is raising is a generation of the many parts of that one man. For in creation, there are only two men. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. First Corinthians 15, 47. But the last man, the last man, the last Adam Christ, is a life-giving spirit. So there's only one man. This meeting is about that man. The times and seasons are about that man. We are changing governments and having elections and changing economic policies. It's all about that one. He's the only one who prophecy was written about before he came. Jesus is the only man that we will worship. For there is one God and man. And there is one mediator between God and man. The man Jesus Christ. Jesus, before he was born, 42 generations had to be prepared. The book of the generation of Jesus, Matthew chapter 1. Look at it. From Abraham to David, 14 generations. From David to Zerubbabel, 14 generations. From Zerubbabel to Christ, 14 generations. Jesus is the mixture of 14 generations of ordinary men which included Ruth the Moabite and Rahal the Harlot. That means that he's consummating everything. There's nothing that he's not part of. The first 14 generations ended with David a fugitive. David the man. Then David the king 
till Zerubbabel. That means not only is he an ordinary man, that is also a king. So in the loins of Jesus is kingship. So from David to Zerubbabel, till they carried Zedekiah to Babylon. He was a king. Then look at it. Then people think we are slaves and therefore Christ has no way to work with us. From Zerubbabel to the carrying away, they carried them into captivity. 14 generations of slaves, including Daniel. Jesus came through those lines. That means that there's nothing that my Jesus does not represent or typify. All the errors have come and gone and they are consummated in one man. His name is Jesus. So now what is our task? What is our job? Our job is to locate ourselves in this Jesus. Paul said in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, To me who am less than the least of the apostles, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. That means that Christ's riches is beyond all kings put together. The riches of repentance, the riches of righteousness, the riches of deliverance, the riches of grace, the riches of mercy and peace, the riches of favor. Kings have been rated on the basis of wealth. But Solomon in all his wisdom, Jesus came to make Solomon's wisdom small. He said even Solomon was not dressed like these birds. So even though Solomon up until his day was the fearsome one that Sheba had to come and witness. He says Solomon in all his wisdom was not clothed like these birds. That means he has robbed the wisdom of Solomon. So now the riches of Christ that we pervade and we talk about is not money. So we are not called to make money. Your ministry is not about money. Ministry is not about money. Ministry, I am in the media and a lot of you guys who are musicians and talented, when God gives you a song or gives you a gift, there are people who have made themselves pillars. They call themselves producers and directors. And if you don't tilt the music to suit the market, they won't produce you. If you don't make the music sound some way, they won't play it on radio. But those days are coming to an end. The days where men have set themselves to redefine what God has called you to do. Those days are coming to an end. Your music's impact is not based on how many times it's played on the radio. It's not based on how many producers love it. No, that's not, that's not the type of ministry. Ministry has three dimensions. Ministry is serving God. A lot of people ask you, why don't you leave the media and go and preach? I said, I'm already in ministry. I'm already in ministry. Now, Oye Depo, one of my mentors, he says, ministry is not a person who is in full-time preaching. A minister is somebody who is in full-time obedience. That's ministry. That's ministry. So you can be preaching and not be in ministry. You can be white washing plate in papaya and be in ministry. I'm telling you. So now we are redefining ministry. God is going to locate us in our various places. I'm telling you. God is going to locate you in. There are ministries God is giving you that men have not seen before. God is raising you to do some strange things in the kingdom. But you, there are three things you need to do. And I'll end on those three. Because you, you, your ministry is not about a cassock and a sword. It's about the posture of your heart. That's ministry. Ministry. He said, ask the minister to the Lord. Let's look at First Samuel. Because I think I'm shouting too much. There, there, there are many things I could say about Samuel. I don't have time. But one of the things we notice is that anytime God is changing errors, he raises a man who is powerful. When he was moving from the era of the patriarchs to the priests and the generals, he raised a man called Moses. Moses was more than a patriarch. He was everything. And when he was moving from the era of the patriarchs into the era of the judges, and from the era of the judges into the era of the kings, because there were many judges who brought recession to the land, between the era of the judges and the era of the kings and the prophets, he raises a man. His name is Samuel. It was the response to a prayer by a woman who was called barren. And the woman loaned this boy to the Lord. So Samuel is more than a prophet. He was a Nazarite. He was judge. He was prophet. He was almost king. He was, he was sitting. The Bible said from Dan to Bathsheba, everybody knew who Samuel was. And we are in very strange times. God is going to raise some very strange people who would double in various kinds of ministries. Like Samuel. Samuel could prophesy, but Samuel hacked Agag into pieces before the Lord. God is not looking for gentle people. He's looking for obedient people. 
Saul's failure was being too gentle. He was more gentle than God. And Samuel the prophet hugged Agag into pieces. Our kingship is based on whether we establish righteousness or not. So you are called into ministry if you are establishing righteousness where you are, not whether you are preaching. Look at Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 11. I'm reading a few scriptures and I'll close. I have five minutes. 1 Samuel 2 11. Then Elkanah went to his house at Ramah. But the child ministered to the Lord before the priest. God found him as a child. Ministry is not about how old you are. The child ministered to the Lord. Look at verse 18. 1 Samuel 2. But Samuel ministered even as a child wearing a linen effort. So God doesn't need you to be 40 before he puts you into ministry. You don't need to be 40 to be in ministry. You're already in ministry. Ministry has three characteristics. The first characteristic is obedience. Obedience. We'll go to that quickly. Look at 1 Samuel, Samuel 3 1. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord. The Bible was careful because a lot of us are ministering to men. We are ministering to the cameras. We are ministering to the media. Samuel, at a young age, learned how to minister to the Lord. Before Eli. The Bible said the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Look at it. God spoke to Samuel about Eli. God is not going to bend his rules because you are young. The Bible said Samuel went to lie down. And God came and said, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel went to Eli and said, have you called me? Eli said, I've not called you. Then go and lie down. Samuel went to lie down again. God came, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel went to Eli, have you called me? Eli said, I've not called you. Go and lie down again. The Bible said, when Samuel came the third time, Eli perceived that God had called the boy. And Eli said to Samuel, go and lie down again. And it shall be when he calls you, you must say, speak Lord, your servant hears. No matter how young you are, God will not break rules for you. Until Samuel gave the right response, God wasn't going to go ahead. So the Bible said, and the Lord came and stood as at the other three times. And he said, Samuel, Samuel. Now Samuel had been taught by an old prophet. He said, speak Lord for thy servant hear it. Then God gave him a prophecy that was going to change the course of history. He says, I'm going to work a work in Eli's life. I'm going to kill him and his sons. He wasn't even a teenager. God gave him a prophetic word for the nation. And then Samuel, when he woke up, Eli said, what did God say to you? Then that was the first test of whether he was qualified to be a servant of God or not. Some of you, God has spoken to you by looking at people's faces. Now, Samuel didn't want to tell Eli because the news didn't sound palatable. So these days we have prophets who only speak good news. They only come and prophesy good things. But the Bible said, when they say it is peace and safe, then a sudden destruction. God, and, then some, and then Eli said, may the Lord do to you if you don't tell me the truth. Samuel learned a lesson of obedience. You don't look at people's face. A minister of God is one who can speak God's word irrespective of who's standing in front of him. Now, young guys, God is going to use you. But trust me, he's going to test you. He's not going to bend the rules for you. Someone had to respond the right way for God to continue speaking. Romans chapter 6 verse 16. How do you become a servant of God? It says, you have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which you have received. And being servants of sin, now you are servants of God. So a servant is somebody who obeys God from their heart. Are we together? So obedience is a heart issue, not a mouth issue. Obedience. So he said, having obeyed from the heart, the form of doctrine. So your heart is the tool for service. When God is calling a minister, it's not about his robe or his sword or his position or his color. It's about the quality of his heart. It says in Psalm 89 verse 20, I have found David, my servant. Found him because of his heart. As we enter the next realm of worship, God is going to touch your heart. Lord, direct our hearts to love you into service. May we be lovers of God. He says, no man can serve two masters. <laughs> For he will either hate one or love the other. other. Or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. Service is from the heart. As we worship and minister to him, pray that God will touch your heart and give you the heart of a servant. Ministry is about the heart. It's the type of heart you have that determines the ministry you occupy. 
Lord, as we enter the next realm of worship, work on our hearts. Lord, we are not here for entertainment. We are here for operation. Open your mouth and ask God to help you. Direct my heart into the love of Christ. 2 Timothy 3. 2 Thessalonians 3. Direct my heart into the love of God. So I will be a proper servant and a minister. It's not about preaching. Lord, it's about the heart. Give me the heart of a servant. Give me the heart of a servant. Give me the heart of a servant. As we open our hearts to receive worship and to bless you, work your work in our hearts. In the name of Jesus. Put your hands together for the Lord Jesus. Amen.